Welcome to Well Good Movies, the podcast for film fans by film fans. Every episode, we look at films old and new to choose what should be preserved for all time in our movie vault. With lively topics, big questions, and crazy challenges to entertain us and our guests, we always look to have fun by giving you the topics worth discussing and the movies worth watching, even if there are some duds along the way. But don't just take my word for it. Here's a preview of what to expect in today's episode. Just to be clear, I'm going to do this. Some of it will be fine. Some of this will be trash. But we don't criticize. We just Absolutely accept. Not. We just accept I'm going to be bad, and we just move on. Okay. Okay. All good. <clears throat> All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Are you not entertained? I am your father. Great! Got you! Turn on! Oh! Here's Johnny. I'll be back. It's not the Well, good movies! Hello, and welcome to Well, Good Movies, the podcast that gives you the topics worth discussing and the movies worth watching. I am your host, David Osger. And I'm coming to you through the powers of the internet, through the powers of Zoom, uh, which recently has caused quite a bit of drama and comedy for us all. So in that spirit, I'd like to introduce our very own Jackie Weaver. It is Craig McDonald. I am not a cat. (laughs) You're not a cat. Yeah. Okay. I thought I'd bring in another famous uh, Zoom reference. Oh, yes. Yeah, of course. (laughs) Can you turn it off? Uh, No, I I don't know what to do. I was just going to say the fact he felt it necessary to reassure the judge. Just just to clarify, I, I'm not a cat. Yeah. <laughs> As if, like, the judge is going to be, is this seriously your legal defense? Just some feline from the street. <laughs> I just wanted some reason to tell you to read the standing orders, Craig. Read them and understand them. <laughs> so, so angry. Yeah, but David, you don't want to get into an argument with me about whether or not I have the authority? <laughs> Craig has got the power to remove me in this uh, in this situation. So it's All true. Right. It's my Zoom call. Yeah, you're, exactly. You're on so. thin. You're on thin ice. I'll just put Clark in my name, David Oscar Clark. Like, yep, yeah, I'm immune now. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah. Joining us today is our good friend. He is a filmmaker and photographer. It is Alid Clear Griffiths. Hello, Alid. Hello. How's it going? It's the original Alid's iPad. Are you coming to you, to us through your iPad today? Oh my god. <laughs> I was trying to think, of, like, how can I kind of get involved in this band? So I didn't even think of that. Yeah, I just, I just loved it when you were on Twitter. Like, what's this Alid's iPad all about? So confused. I was like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> Somebody's hacked my iPad, <laughs> giving giving Alid a bad name. So, how have you been? What have you been up to? I mean, I guess who who is having a wonderful time right now? I don't know about you guys, but like, I found this one, this one, this one's so much harder than than the first one. I guess it's just kind of like that seasonal thing mm. um, and a lockdown on top of that isn't exactly helping. So I'm just, I'm just trying to bury myself in as much work as possible. So I have to kind of like look up until when it's at least a bit warmer to go outside. But all things considered, as they all say, not too bad. You know, it could be a lot worse. Healthy and employed. So. And for anybody who doesn't know, at the moment you've got like a new studio. So, so what is it you're working in and doing at the moment? So I've been pretty busy freelancing and since since I'd say like August last year. So I've been doing a lot of work with with companies like S4C, the BBC, um, a bit a bit of Hanch and stuff, which is there's a lot of like Welsh based content, which is nice to kind of finally get to use that I thought kind of moving down to Cardiff to work. I thought that would have been my superpower, but it's taken me a little while to to get that up and running. Um so yeah, just a bit of filmmaking. Um I do some photography stuff on the side and I've started selling selling some of my own prints, which is pretty exciting. Um, that's going down well. I kind of, the other day, only just kind of came out of my, so I've just made all my money back from kind of, you know, the, the money you've got to put into invest in getting stuff printed and stuff. So so finally made a profit, which feels great. Good, <laughs> I can yeah. pay my rent now, which is fab. <laughs> um, but I made these little, um, I made these little cards. So with every kind of order, you get these cards. And I, obviously people who are listening won't be able to see this, but it says, thank you for your purchase. I can now pay my rent, which is, okay. which feels good. That's how a lot of creatives are going about it at the moment as well, isn't it? I, I prefer that being so transparent is like somebody I watch on YouTube. They just say, I have a Patreon. It's helping pay my bills at the moment. And, you know, like keeping the lights on and stuff, but they don't pressure people. They're also like, but if you're not in that position, that's totally cool. Da, da, da. You can also like and share and do all that kind of stuff to support me as well. So 
yeah, it's a, it's a good balance, balancing act, I think, of doing that kind of stuff. So shall we hear what's coming up on today's episode? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Let's go in today's episode, we'll be talking all about influential movies. Thanks to our guest, Alid, we're feeling inspired. And so we'll be discussing how different films appeal to us and the importance of representation. We'll also be going through the individual films and creators that influence us and why we feel they speak directly to us. But before all that, as Alid is a filmmaker who can work in the medium of Welsh, we thought it'd be fun to test Craig's familiarity with the language. So, uh, Craig, how, how do you feel your pronunciation is going to be? Uh... Are you Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> well, to get off for a good start, I could tell you that our name translated in Welsh, Alid admitted is not exact translation, but roughly, which I did enjoy, is uh, Filmiai Dayaun. <laughs> like, that, that sounds a lot happier, I think. It's like, ah. Oh. So just think back to school. Dayaun, well done. But yeah, Craig, here's our... Here's our sort of opening motto in in Welsh. If you think you can give that a go, right? If it helps, like I I would struggle to sort of say a couple of those. Like I would probably throw the word podcast in there myself, just to turn it a bit wang wanglish. Yeah, there's a bit of that in the Hanch stuff, isn't it? Like flipping between like English and because it is like sayings and stuff, which obviously, like you said, don't work. Just to be clear, <laughs> I'm going to do this. Some of it will be fine. Some of this will be trash. <laughs> We don't criticize. We just Absolutely accept. Not. We just accept. I'm going to be bad, and we just move on. Okay. Okay. All good. A pod lady, I seen Roy Pinky. I seen where it traveled. Ichi are filmy. I seen where it guehio. That's pretty good. But it's better, better than I would do. <laughs> definitely. Genuinely not bad. Yeah. yeah. Pretty pretty good actually. That's a that's definite pass. Yeah, I think I use up all my ability to pronounce Welsh just by memorizing the name of Clan via PG perfectly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, Craig has that bit more background. I'm pretty sure he had a bit greater than me in, in uh, Welsh GCSE. And there's also just the fact that you're around a lot more education, etc. So, Ali, do you want to show us how it's done? You know, saying like, welcome to our good movies with that with that slogan. Uh, so, welcome to good movies would probably be "Chroso uh, i filmia dayaun," and then and then your your uh, slogan would probably be "Podlediai sin froi punkai sin werthi travod ichi ar filme sin werthi gwilio." Whenever I make these hunch videos, my friends who don't speak Welsh always sort of say to me like, "It was really good." I mean, to me, it was just a lot of like spitting and, and <laughs> not a lot of sense. But it was really good. I enjoyed it. I find, especially if you do watch certain things on S Four C, there's that balance, isn't it, of people who like. Because it's a very theatrical language. So there's those people who I'm like, that doesn't sound like they're doing like a good performance. Whereas I found with like your kind of stuff, it does kind of sound natural. It sounds like you're talking normally. <laughs> it's not this kind of like, oh, he's loud. You know, it's like, it's kind of like you're talking like a normal human being. But with Can a we different not language. exacerbate the reasons why I do not <laughs> like certain people's ability to have a Welsh accent? <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah go uh where, where can we check out those videos uh Alid? it's on the yeah so if you just go on youtube and put in hanch it's it's all there yeah hanch's youtube is probably the best place to go <laughs> hang on we've already gone to the to the where can we find you section of the podcast jesus christ that was quick all right see you guys next episode <laughs> craig's escaping before we get some spanish out or some french or something <laughs> So yeah, we've had you know a look into the arts in in Wales as as you maybe one day we'll have Alid on talking about Welsh films or something like that. Um, might be a bit more limited, but uh, yeah, generally today we are talking about our influential films, the films that we either grew up on or we saw later in life and has helped us creatively, and we think they are important to us as film. Uh, makers or film fans and sort of define us and why those certain films speak to us more than other films so Alid what what is your feelings on how films like influence you and count towards when you're working creatively whether it be in because you know you're somebody who sort of thrives on a lot of different aspects of creative creation you sort of you know do graphics and photos it's not all just like filmmaking yeah, well, it's it's all kind of like that that idea of self-expression, isn't it? It's kind of when you talk about films specifically, it's like what what do you kind of see in a film? Like what speaks to you? Like what do you see in a film that like you kind of see in yourself? 
and I think that's kind of the idea, but it, it can also be the complete opposite of that. Like, so the last, like the last actual like film film I made was all about grief. And that was kind of birthed out of this idea of, of frustration where, you know, not to, not to bring the, 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 the vibe of this podcast down, but it, the, the film was about grief because I'd, I kind of experienced sort of two sets of loss quite, quite close together. But there was, there was nothing kind of out there for me that I, I felt like was going to help. I always say like I'm not the best at kind of articulating how I feel. I kind of try to do it through just like making stuff, which is why I, want, I thought, right, let's just let's kind of take all this kind of angst and, and feeling and put it into something that could be quite productive. So, yeah, it's, it, it can kind of be looked at in, in two ways, really. But when you talk about kind of the films that you see and you're kind of like, wow, this really speaks to me. I think for me anyway, it, it's something where I, I watch a film and I'm like, this is, this is totally spoken to me. And like, as like a Welsh gay person, if, if, if it's like the, the film Pride, I don't know if, you've, if you guys have seen it. It's about kind of gay culture in London, but it's set in kind of like the Welsh valleys and it's bringing these two complete opposite worlds together. And it's like, how often do you, do you see that? And you're kind of like, oh my God, this film's like really speaking to me. And it's those films that, that that really kind of stay with you i guess yeah and, and like you said it it depends on what kind of person you are as well how you express yourself so like you said there there can be a lot of people who will thrive off of so more darker stories or like horror etc whereas then there's other creatives who might sort of express themselves by sort of how do i divert myself from that so like you said some people will go how can i express what i'm feeling or how can i showcase this and how can i you know because they want to artistically capture that whereas other people will be like i want to get completely away from that how can i cheer myself up how can i transport myself to another world so you know do you find that there's like a mix with your kind of taste or do you find that it's all of sort of one one sort of not so much genre but type of story and type of type of film i don't know i think i've had this kind of like reawakening recently where when i was in uni like i would really struggle with assignments where the topic was really vague like i, I had no idea where to start i always kind of compare it to when you go to the petrol station and you're paying for your petrol and you see like a wall of like 70 different chocolate bars and you're like okay i'm really hungry i don't know which one i want yeah. it's kind of like that where where now if, if i'm kind of given some sort of brief it's kind of like like what do I as a human being living in 2021 like have to say right now? And if the answer is, I don't know, then you're not, you don't need to make a movie. Mm. You've got nothing to say. Like there's nothing new to say. Um, and like, like I said before, like the, the frustration with, with the last movie I made was like, there's nothing out here that's helping me with my grief. So why don't I just make, make a movie with, about grief and be kind of like that person. And if someone stumbles upon this in a few years where they're struggling with their grief, then like the job's done. Um, like it certainly helped me and it certainly helped you know, my family go through it. Um, so it, it's kind of like a new thing, um, to be honest. And I think like that's so important. And I think we'll probably go on to that idea a bit more later on. But I think like if you're approaching a project like that with with as much kind of authenticity as possible, you're kind of halfway already there with with creating something that's going to be engaging. Like when, when it's honest um, and you have something to say, then like, you know, chances are it's going to be pretty good. Yeah. And I think that comes down to a lot of what we're seeing in terms of change in the industry as well is you see it with some of the biggest franchises and you see it with some of the smaller like indie films. A lot of the times those can be successful is because they are coming from a personal place, isn't it? Whereas when a film is more, oh, we're doing this film or we're adapted in this book and we're going to get this guy to do it because he's got a good track record with that kind of stuff. Well, there's no personal connection there. Whereas a lot of films will tend to benefit, um, even with some of the bigger franchises like Star Wars or Marvel or DC, if they can come to it and say, I've got a great idea for what I think this character or what this story should be. So like recently, I think of Patty Jenkins, where they announced that Star Wars film she's doing. She's like, my dad was a pilot and I really want to tell this story about what it's like to be a pilot. And, you know, that sort of camaraderie and all that kind of stuff. And you think, yeah, that's great. So she has like a personal connection to that. It's not just, hey, Patty Jenkins does a Star Wars film. There's a reason for her doing it. And and you can see it already with a lot of series and stuff. People will sort of pitch ideas to studios and streaming services because they're like, this is what I think you should do. This is my vision for that. And that's where it works out a lot better in, in, that, in that sense as well. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it's kind of like what I feel like the industry is really starving from at the moment is 
is like alternative voices that we never really hear from. And I, 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 at the same time, I guess like there's, the studios don't have that kind of like guaranteed bankability and in, in that this is going to make a profit because all they really know is is not to get um, not to get woke, but it's kind of like yeah. you know a, a point of view of like your typical straight white guy telling a typical straight white guy story. It's kind of bankable. Where like you know you could argue that's probably that, that might be why why um, you know female led superheroes superhero movies for example might struggle a little bit mm. um, because they it's never really been done before so they, they don't know what sort of what they're what they're delving into yeah it's like again goes back to patty jenkins isn't it like could you actually be like oh wonder woman this film about like a big female heroine does it make sense for then some guy to tell that story you need you know like they're not from that gender so how can they tell that story and it gets a bit more complicated and like you said it can people can say about like it being woke and stuff mm. when it then gets into more specific groups or um you know backgrounds and that kind of stuff so it's whether you know somebody has to be like of a certain religion or from a certain country so say you know if somebody is from brazil you know like all oh, that story is about brazil do they need to have the director be from brazil or can it be like this person grew up in an equally sort of like ethnic background or something like that so well it's like with, yeah, think, with russell t davis's comments recently about how he wouldn't ever cast a straight guy to play a gay character again it's kind of like it, is that right do we not do we not think more about the the person's ability to act like do you need the real life experience of those real life things to really accurately portray portray yeah. those things before like i was talking to a friend about it not too long ago and it was kind of like I, I kind of get both sides. Like if, if I was in issues and I was, and I was making something about that, like, you know, of course that, that idea would, would cross my mind that, like, okay, do we need to cast someone that's, that's, you know, accurately experienced this before, or, or is it not just the case of like, who is the best person for the job rather yeah. than kind of like, you gay, you straight. Okay. No, you can't play that. You can't play that at all. Yeah. Um, this is, it's like a really interesting, it's a really interesting kind of debate. I think. I think there are definitely some areas though that, Especially with all the stuff about Sia and the film that she's currently producing. I was thinking that. Uh, I'm definitely on the side of. There are just some experiences, I think, if you're going to tell, you need to have, like, a very nuanced understanding of. Um, yeah. So, like, I, I think I think it basically comes down to, like, how... I'm trying to figure out the right word to say, because I don't want to say, like... I think it comes down to the extent to which that, that experience can make can make you as an individual like vulnerable uh, yeah i think there are like some experiences that people will just go back to sort of like problematic aspects of playing i guess mm -hmm. um yeah but then i guess it's it, it, it then kind of opens the door to the idea of like when does the acting start yeah. so like i think of a film so like if we go back to like grief like w w if i was to make another film about grief like would i only want to cast someone who who'd kind of lost someone recently because I felt like that was the only way to kind of accurately portray that. Not that I'm comparing grief to kind of like, I don't know, like being a young black woman in the industry, like, you know, you're not going to cast a white person to play that character. Like we're obviously going to have to cast a certain person to play a certain character or whatever. But, but it's, it's, it's always kind of interesting. Like when does the act, it's like the idea of, you know, we think of um, actors who like only really method act. Yeah. Exactly. Is that acting? Or are you just kind of living that life? Like, <laughs> yes. When does the acting start? Like it's 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 interesting. That's true. I always think it must be so awkward for people to like be on set, you know, when they like don't talk to them and stuff like that because they're like, I am the character, I won't speak to you and stuff. It's like, oh god, that must be so awkward. It's a grey area with certain things, isn't it? Like you, with something like sexuality, that doesn't sort of define somebody or like come on like the front of them as much. So it's something that can be sort of is up for debate but then certain things like you said if somebody is of a certain gender or race then you can't get around that um but yeah all of that comes down to things like how people relate to it so they can watch that and be like oh i can see myself uh, but it also comes down to like things like taste and stuff as well doesn't it like what do you just personally like as a person so whether you do like your sort of more lighter stories your darker stories you know where do you come down on that kind of stuff We'll, we'll get on to like so like our specific choices for what films we feel influence us a lot and so like represent like who we are you know we'll start like with craig what what's one that came to to your mind i mean it's hard for me to sort of choose a film which is 
one that sort of influenced me creatively, given I don't really do that much creatively. So I think I had to sort of uh, think about this from a, a slightly wider perspective. Every fibre of my being was calling out for me to just say Whiplash. Uh, I think <laughs> while that is probably the most relatable film in my life, I probably can't say it's the one that sort of like influenced me because I haven't driven myself to the point of absolute destruction trying to perceive perfection. So I uh, had to rule that out, even though that is my favourite film. So I thought about it. I've probably gone for the film that I think by sheer virtue of just its style and the messages is basically talking about, especially in the way that it talks about, it's ended up being essentially the film that I've probably seen the most times ever, uh, just because of how you know things like channel scheduling worked out in the good old days of BBC Free. But essentially, I think the film that I'm going to be talking about today is uh, V for Vendetta, which for a while was my favourite film. And I think the reason for that is that for me, it was a case of like my first sort of experience looking at like uh, films with just like, you know, deeper political ideological messaging. Um, and I think that's something that in terms of just, you know, thinking about uh, society, obviously one of the things I do, I do a lot of work with. Uh, like critical thinking and debating uh, for students, right? And I think there's a degree to which a lot of that has been influenced just by just like looking at the... Granted, this film definitely takes like the very black and white, bleak perspective of just these people bad, this person good. What's that? They say this person bad. That's that's not true. Which I know that like, you know, uh, Alan Moore, the original... Uh, uh, the original author of the graphic novel wasn't happy about because he definitely uh, liked to play with the idea of essentially the grey area of it, right? The idea of who is actually truly the villain in the, uh, in the situation, or is there any is there any such thing as like a like a a good sort of hero, I guess? But at least the film was sort of like the stepping stone into me just for thinking about those things. Just on top of that, I think then there's just a lot to enjoy about the film like past that messaging uh i think the performances in are great you have like uh hugo weaving giving some beautifully delivered monologues uh like the entire like uh v speech at the beginning at the beginning is something that if it weren't for the fact that i need to basically get a dictionary out every time i hear it is one that i would just definitely try and memorize to death then also you have performances like natalie uh natalie portman john hurt stephen fry just so many great performances and just a really dark story just with like a number of different bran uh, branching pathways but I think that probably is the film that sort of influenced me the most in terms of like my creative uh, my creative love of language um, like like the, crit the, the critical responses but also just sort of a relatively bleak dark sense of humour at times I think that is something that I sort of got from this film as well yeah, that's sort of my starting point, I guess. Yeah, and I suppose it also makes sense that it's similar with other films that we've talked about in the past, such as like Rent and stuff, that it's something that's got like in it. There's like also other emotional stories. So like the the Evie Hammond sort of scene where she reads the, the note from that uh, woman who uh, was killed um, and was sort of taken away, etc., with like her partner, etc. It's like that kind of like there's the biggest story but then there's like also these like other added emotional stories like at the core as well yeah because you have the entire backdrop of of essentially this being a essentially a post-apocalyptic society in a like dystopian future uh given that what america's like fallen apart somehow like yeah. america i mean true maybe but like the fact that they just negotiating send at the beginning of the film, they're just like, oh, should we send the maid? No, let's let's not. They're morons and they're traitors to God. Isn't it actually that in the film they're like ridden by disease? <laughs> so I, don't... I, I think they're described as like a nuclear uh, nuclear wasteland at one point. Yeah, but I also thought they said something about them being lepers or something like that. But probably are as well. I mean, like <laughs> yeah. the entire thing that caused this was a virus. Yeah. So. Uh -oh. Do not make the comparison. <laughs> yeah, no, I, like I said, I think that that one does quickly make sense. And I remember, again, you know, it, it's sort of impacting you a lot 
you know, when we were younger and stuff, you, you dressed as V uh, for like a charity day in, in school even. Yeah, there's a great picture in a, uh, in a local newspaper of me just holding the mask just in front of me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I won't say what a, a, an awful kid decided to write under the caption of that picture. Because, <laughs> um, you know, kids are kids are dicks. <laughs> Or like published, or just somebody like hand wrote it on there. Well, yeah, they they put up like the article on the on the sixth form like board, and where it said under my picture Craig is V, somebody just then added to the V a Gina. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's just, that's just uh, childish humor, like epitomized right there. School humor, definitely. Yeah, like I said, yeah, I think that one sort of does like make sense for you. And like you said, even with things like debating and stuff, isn't it? It's talking about like heavy themes and like oppression and like, you know, having this debate about like whether people are right and wrong and, and uh, yeah, and just the fun of overturning governments and blowing a parliament at the same time, just that chaotic, <laughs> chaotic nature of things. Uh, Alid, what, what did you sort of think of when you were thinking of the films or film that is most influential to you? Well, it's... Like you could you could totally interpret that question in so many in so many different ways. But like referring to the tweet that you referenced at the beginning of of the podcast earlier, um, like when I saw it, my first thought was like, like what made me love movies? What made me love like uh, kind of expressing myself through films and stuff? And it's it's definitely kind of um, when I was first introduced to Stanley Kubrick, um, and I'll get on to kind of my my favorite Kubrick film, but I just love kind of his um, ideas and his kind of perspective on like how he made, uh, how he made his movies, like just thematically throughout his entire filmography, there are like themes that he kind of continuously explored and just how, how all of his films were so kind of, I think ahead of, ahead of its time, I think with the vast majority of, of his movies kind of when they were first, um, released didn't do so well like they got like a kind of a very um a mixed response um i think I, I might be wrong in this though but i think the only film of his that might have not done so well box office wise was barry linden and just through because i did i did um i did a module in uni about kubrick which is kind of where all this was was birthed and kind of when it kind of blew my mind in terms of like something like, that's how you can make a film like you can kind of do it this way um and I think, and I think, um, I'll, I'll say it now, like, I think The Shining is probably my favorite Kubrick film, which I think among kind of diehard Kubrick fans, would, it would be kind of like the wrong answer. Like it has to be either 2001 or whatever. It's like, in, in my opinion, it's not his best film, probably not even in his, in his top three, but there's just something about The Shining. I don't know what it is. I, when I watch it, I kind of get that feeling and I'm going to sound completely bonkers saying this, but I get this kind of weird deja vu feeling as if like I kind of lived I've lived that life, which is really weird. Like for just like the the color scheme and the set design and and everything, I just think it's it's so good. Like it's such a masterpiece, and I love how it's just kind of it's aged so well. Like it was made what over forty years ago now, and it's still kind of known as that uh, kind of definitive horror movie. And it's inspired so many other films as well. The fact that we got the sequel to it, what like last year, year before, I think as well was. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, and just to go back to kind of his his approach to to making films, it, you know, I, I think at the time, like the fact that within the first few minutes, you're told that Jack Nicholson's character is a bad guy. Like this isn't, he's not a hero. This is not going to be like a redemption arc. Like you are told he is a bad, it's, it's not a case of of if he's going to hurt his family. It's it's more of a case of when. Mm. Um, and when I kind of studied this, this way of making films, I was like, oh my God, he's like completely taking the rule book and throwing it out the window. And that's, and that's amazing. And it's like, you know, he completely trusts his audience to kind of pick, pick these things up, which is why I think it's, it's aged so well um, as the years have gone by. Um, like there's, there's so many like books and there's so many documentaries, e even just for The Shining, like sort of pulling it apart. And there's all these theories and it's all there that like, pretty much every theory you can think of, it's pretty valid. Like there's evidence for it there, whether it's like complete bullshit or not. Have you have you guys seen that one? Is it like two room two thirty seven? It's kind of like the go to documentary people have with with The Shining. Like I'm not really that big of a fan of it. I think it's, it's like horribly made, um, and like a lot of what they say 
it's just like it's just nonsense like there's no kind of it's a theory yeah but mm. anyway just to like walk away from that yeah i think i think it, answering the question in that way I'd, I'd probably say like any any kubrick film I'd, I'd say his best film is probably eyes wide shut because i think eyes wide shut is is pretty much an amalgamation of every film he's he's ever made yes yeah, so i think the answer to that would be kubrick but at the same time i think when i think of films that have kind of when I've watched and I thought oh my god that was speaking directly to me I'd probably say um call me by your name so mm. I watched that I went to the cinema to watch that with like my first proper boyfriend and I left it and I kind of like looked at him differently and I was like is this what is this what I really want is this what like real love is like what is all this and like I, I guess to kind of go back to what we were talking about before with like whether a gay person person should play a gay character or whatever like I I, I totally believed in particular sort of Timothy Chalamet, I think Ami Hammer's reputation is a bit questionable right now. <laughs> we'll go there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did see Call Me By Your Name come up quite a few times on like people retweeting that. Um, so I was like, oh, I was like, oh wow, that film's done really well for sort of like, like I said, even though you've got load, like films like Moonlight, uh, Moonlight and stuff out there, like there's something about that film that specifically spoke to a lot of people uh, compared to like a lot of other similar like awards contenders, etc., which I found uh, impressive. And yeah, that's that's what I find interesting, especially with your choice of uh, Kubrick movies. With because not long ago as well, we had um, an episode which was about uh, films that you hate that everyone else loves, and uh, so in that one, we did have The Shining was mentioned by our guest then Joe Richards, but that was coming at it from one of those kind of like it's not faithful to the book kind of approaches, and it wasn't so much like he hated it; he just didn't buy into the hype as as many people do. But I think there is a lot to say about how iconic that film is. It, yeah, I do find it funny that you say you, you almost feel like you lived through it. It's like, I'm like, North Wales isn't that bad, is it? Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that it's, it's like you said, it's, you know, the, the carpet, for example, isn't it? Like, that's the one I always go to is that that's so iconic is that people will buy a book and it's got like the carpet uh, pattern on the, on the notebook and you know, the, the blood coming through the elevator. It's all kind of moments that aren't like these big, massive set pieces. They're just small moments within the film. And it kind of hit home, especially when I saw Ready Player One. And although I was kind of watching it thinking, well, this is probably a rights thing. You know, it's the studio has the right to use The Shining, whereas they maybe don't have the right to use other iconic films. But still, there's something to say that like a film that comes out in 20... 18 is it or 2019 or something when ready player one come out that they're actually paying reference to, like you said this 40 year old horror film in this big cgi video game movie and i was like that shows how iconic that film is that everyone would watch that and go oh i know what they're talking about yeah and it's, it's referenced in, like like you said in so many different places like like not even in like a, such an obvious way and i think that the main example that i can think of is like toy story in, in Sid's house, the carpet upstairs is mm. is the same carpet as The Shining, and it's just like you know this. this I guess this whole episode is about kind of iconic, like, sort of iconic in, inspired things, and like you said, you know, the, even that something as small as the pattern of the carpet is so kind of iconic. It's in a in a kid's animation, yeah. like thirty years later. And have you found that film, like say, or just Kubrick stuff in general, like seeps into how you work or like the, the kind of stuff you're interested in making and that kind of stuff? Or Like I, you know, but even even when it kind of comes to um, like what process of, of making films is like the most important, like, you know, he says, I think, you know, editing is, is kind of where you really kind of write the film. And it's yeah. so true. You know, any kind of um, approach to, to a project I have, I, I I would definitely subconsciously kind of maybe even sometimes like even realizing would would kind of use similar processes to, to to how he kind of looked at, and I and I tried to kind of, and when I was in uni and I was like kind of like pumping out a film every top two or three weeks, I wanted them all to kind of have a reference to each other, not so much in an obvious way, but like just thematically, like you could you could easily kind of put one thing from one film to another thing to another film. And I wanted mm. to do that because my hero Kubrick did it. Yeah. And as well, kind of that, that idea of trusting your audience to understand it. You know, there's so much there's so much of of his films that I think people would be like, I didn't I didn't get it. But if you watch it a couple more times, like things just sort of slowly 
kind of snap into into place and it's like that idea of not having to worry whether people are going to get it because it's there to be found like they might not get it straight away but it's there um and i think it it, it makes that process just so much so much easier as well um so yeah like he's, he was a, a massive inspiration like i've got a bookshelf over there like 60 percent of the books are kind of kubrick related like i'm a bona fide fanboy <laughs> um, and as well like i don't think this is connected but he started his his career as a photographer you know in in pretty much all of his films like every frame is like a is like a painting in itself and i like when i was a student i was kind of like right do i need to kind of know everything everything about a camera before i have the audacity to start making films because that's what he did but at the same time you know it's also important to kind of find your own path and stuff like originality is also so important um which is why i think the idea of like what do i have to say is also so important when it comes to stuff like that well it also goes back to what we said before isn't it it's about adding your voice and why that person is important to tell that story and like you said is to have that connectivity between your films it's why people like quentin tarantino and christopher nolan have also become really famous you know especially nolan recently people you know talking with uh tenant because it's very much again a film that kind of sticks to some of the tropes and the elements that he has in a lot of his films and while nobody you know well i'm not saying it anyway it's not like it's like oh they all happen in the same universe or whatever but you know somebody could make that argument if they wanted to and you know there's definitely reoccurring themes and parts of that in in all of his films so and which you again you don't get as much and i think that that's what's interesting what you were saying there because that's kind of what i was taught as well is that kind of creative hold on something is that many people who are successful as well in Hollywood will have that control over the entire project. It's not so much like, right, I've directed this now, goodbye. Like you said, is that editing is when, you know, the film is written and often you will see people like James Gunn, for example, he's there like, yeah, we're editing the film now. And he's like heavily involved in the writing process and the editing process and the directing of that film. It's not somebody who just sort of like makes it and goes or writes it and goes away it's like they have that control over the entire thing. Also, like people like Tarantino and and Nolan. Yeah, like to me, like it, it, like I, it baffles me that like filmmakers can kind of uh, work work at something and then kind of let someone else like, kind of finish it off. Like so, for example, with these with these like smaller hunch videos I make, like they kind of reach out to people with like ideas and stuff. And we, like, would you want to make this for us? Like, I was approached because. Um, I don't know if you remember, but during the first lockdown, when it, when the weather got a bit nicer and the rules kind of relaxed a little bit, not to bring this up again, sorry, mm. Greg. Um, yeah. We were kind of gathering in the bay and drinking, and then like next next morning, like Saturday morning, you have like Wales online articles saying like, look at the look at the mess they've made, look mm. at the, the, the disgusting it is. Yeah. Um, and I went out for a walk one night, and I just like did a video. There was hundreds of people sort of gathering. I did a video and kind of turn the camera around and sort of raise, raise my eyebrows and put it on Twitter and said something like, have fun, but like behave. And then I got an email from some, um, this girl that works for Hanch and she was like, we want to do a piece on this. Like, would you be interested in making like a little, little video? You can make it humorous. You can like kind of do whatever you want. And that's why I like working with them so much is that they kind of like, they give you like the seed of an idea, but they do let you run with it and do whatever you want. And um, actually I was, I was on a zoom call with, with someone from Hanch today, just talking about new ideas and, and they were saying like the majority of our um, collaborators literally just like make a video with their iPhone, film it, and then send it to us and we get our editors to do it. And I was kind of like, what? Yeah. That's not make sense. Like I would never in a million years let someone else edit something that I'd made because in my, like for me, that's when the film comes together, it's in the edit. And I want like, I want my voice to be the, the thing that drives that edit the most. And it's sad actually, because I think like, especially in, in Hollywood is something that we're just not seeing as much of anymore. Like I, I get, like I love movies where you can sit down and you can watch it and you know exactly who the voice is behind the pictures that you're seeing. Like, it, you know, you could watch a scene from like, like you said, the Tarantino film and you're like, this is, this is definitely a Tarantino film. And like, that's, that's what I love the most about, about films when there's a, like a distinct voice behind the story that you're investing like two and a half hours into. Um, it's just not as kind of prominent anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, that was what was interesting where like Craig brought up V Vendetta before the episode before we recorded. I said that a lot of people uh, saw see that film as a Wachowski film because they produced it. But a lot of people saw say that they shadow directed it. And uh, I was kind of like, 
Well, you can understand the argument that people would say they see it as a part of their filmography because, again, it it links so much with their other themes of uh, dystopian society and sort of, you know, those with the power and those without, you know, like The Matrix and, and those kind of films. So, you know, it's interesting, again, like you said with Kubrick and, you know, we mentioned Nolan, et cetera, is adding to that, that filmography of films that all kind of have a voice, like you said. And I think as well, like, it's it, another thing that I really admired about his work was that he had, like, complete control over every aspect of, of his production. There's a, there's a funny story um, in, like, one of the many documentaries about him where they were making um, Full Metal Jacket, and they were, for the Vietnam stuff, they they got this location in East London somewhere that they were bulldozing down, and they sort of brought in palm trees to make it look like sort of um, Vietnam, war-ridden Vietnam. And um, he was... Um, Vincent D'Onofrio that that was about to do a scene and there was like a van sort of parked out in the corner and there was like a bunch of guys in there and he sort of turned to Kubrick and was like what's, what's this and he just sort of turned to him very nonchalant and he was like oh it's the Warner Brothers execs and he was like oh and it turns out they'd sent these guys to the, to the set to sort of see how progress was going because I think they were a little behind the schedule um, but he, he had that ability to be like you're not going to like you're not stepping foot on my set unless you're in a van that's hidden with curtains so you don't see anything it was a complete waste of time. Like they were there to see what was going on, and he was like, "No, okay, Mr. Kubrick, yeah, that's fine. You can do that." Like that would be unheard of now. You could maybe argue there's a handful of directors that could could get away with doing that, but probably not to the to the extent that he he had, sort of thing. Yeah, no, definitely he is like infamous for a reason. And like you said earlier, I know that when I was studying film and stuff, it's again, even though it is the more cliche one, it was like 2001, that was my first experience of seeing it because we had to do like this project about like understanding shots and stuff like that. So you had to like reference different shots and different films. And this book that I have uh, sort of says, you know, a classic example of a cut is the cut from the monkey throwing the bone to the the spaceship. And um, it was like, oh, do do I reference that one? Because that is just the the typical one. But then I watched that film. And like you said earlier, it's just every image is like a painting and it's like perfect. And that's where it did strike me then is that that visuals or like how you can construct a shot and and a film to to be what you want, which he, he perfectly does in that. Ironic that you did say about the shining car, uh, the carpet with uh, Toy Story because that's where my mind actually went to with the uh, this because my when I think of like you know my personal favorite films and stuff like that often it can be you know Star Wars and things like that you know the things that I grew up with because it's that nostalgia and it's that sort of escapism uh, that I love and it's that big theatrics of the movies you know so like your Indiana Jones and your Spielbergs and you know, I'm like, I really enjoy like Matthew Vaughan's films, you know, they're like crazy, you know, silly, stupid films, but they've all all got like a really good visual aesthetic, but also with a good story behind it and a good script. Um, But ultimately when I was thinking about like influential, I was like, well, you know, something like Star Wars isn't really influential. I enjoy the story and I enjoy the world, but it doesn't sort of like speak to me personally. And I was thinking about the films like the ones that do and Like I just kept coming back to sort of like the Pixar films because it's something that spoke to me since I was a child and then continued to do for a long time. So it's the fact that I've grown up with these films and even like you where I'll see certain uh, dramas or sort of more artistic films that be like, oh, wow, that really spoke to me. So like, uh, can you ever forgive me, for example, like that film uh, with Melissa McCarthy that I was like, wow, that character is like so much like me, you know, that, you know. And that I loved that sort of like setting and like the the character she was playing. But again, it was hard to shake that feeling of something like Toy Story, which has just been there since my childhood. And I think also like you, Alid, is that how they made it is just as important and influential as well is the fact that it was the first ever fully 3D animated film is that you kind of have to give it kudos for that. But it's also what we were saying about, you know, taking your time and creating it and being having full control of the wheel because all of the Pixar films or especially those sort of first 10 they always had the idea that we will develop this story over like four or five years we'll make sure that it's perfect and we'll make sure that everything makes sense we don't want to rush into anything and we'll never sort of just do anything for for the sake of it we'll never do anything gimmicky uh, which animated films of all films can be 
And I think that's what makes me sort of appreciate them as a lot more as well, is that, say, something like to- Toy Story, for example, and that's my main example, is the first Toy Story film, is that you have sequences like the Sid sequences which have no right to be referencing Stanley Kubrick and like horror and having these really dark scarring images of like baby dolls or mechanical legs and stuff and that's why I think I appreciate it more because I'm like it's not the job of that film to do that it's made for kids it's made as an animated thing so when they do make the effort to do that that's why I appreciate it more whereas if it's an actual horror film then I'm like well you were making a horror film whereas when Disney etc will do something which they're like, yeah, this is for kids, but we're also going to make this really dark, you know, adult message inside of it. And I sort of like appreciate that a lot more because the film has no right to do that. And it sort of goes above its expectations in that way. And it also just like Craig said earlier, but with V Vendetta is they can put that on more of a, a simplistic message, which can get you on board with more deeper meanings with other films, etc. So I just love the creativity they take to all of their films. And again, it's, it's Toy Story that sort of shows that to me. Because as, as much as people will say that, you know, they might prefer two or three, to me, the first one always speaks to me more personally because I just appreciate the, the nuances of it. I love the idea of them going like, hey, let's make like these playful toys, like work like a really organized society in which they're like, you know, staff meeting and all this kind of stuff. And I'll always go to um, the army man scene, like in that first film, like I'll watch that now and be like, this is crazy that like they've gone to this much effort to make this like really staged theatrical epic, you know, sequence, which is just a bunch of army men go check out what presence this kid's arriving on on the day. But they approach it with such a serious element of, you know, going down the skipping rope, getting into the plant pot that, you know, the, the, the army man gets stepped on, go on without me and all this kind of stuff. It's just, you appreciate that extra level of, of artistry, which goes towards something that has no right to, to, to be that deep and meaningful. I think there's as well, like there's a sense of, especially for like our generation, people, our age, there's like a sense of ownership, especially with the first one. Like I, I'm the same as you. Like I, I love the, the Toy Story films, but there's something about that first one. Mm. I think it's because like it came out when we were at the right age. We've like grown up with these characters. Like I, I, I was so close to picking Toy Story 4 as kind of my answer to this, to this podcast to talk about because I've never in my life Mm-hmm. ball at a film like I did for the fourth one there was just something I, I think there was like three or four occasions where I like wept like a baby yeah. um, and it's because like you know these these characters mean so much to to us like they were like you know Woody was my first best friend like I I, I had the Woody doll like the first kind of first gen original one yeah um, I took him to school with me and he was like my best bud and like as like a, like a mid-twenties you know, grown ass man sat in the cinema weeping at, at this. Like, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna ruin the film because I don't want to take that experience from someone, but if you've not watched it, shame on you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, like I said, there's, there's just like the sense of ownership. Like, they're kind of our friends and like you're kind of protective of that as well. It's the, it's the filmmaker's ability to make you so attached to those characters as well. Like you said, is the, you know, I could get that the same with other characters and stuff, but it's something about those performances and the way that they write the characters, especially like you said with Woody, is that he's, he always stays true to that character. They never stray from it. It's kind of like that idea of like, well, who is this character? What does Woody represent? What does Buzz represent? And in every one of those films, they're like, this is what Woody does. This is the story arc he always goes through. Um, so like, again, in like number three, there's that idea of like, oh, Woody will always sort of like have an argument with the, the rest of the toys and he'll sort of go away and then he'll come and save the day at the end. And it's, but it's that more creative idea with Pixar. And that's why like you with like, Kubrick I think like that's why I think of with Pixar as a whole because even though I was thinking that I was thinking well is it the nostalgia with Toy Story but but no like there's moments I can think of in like a lot of Pixar films um, but the ones that stand out to me and speak to me the most is like Ratatouille that film like and like you the other day I I watched this and I was just like this is going to make me emotional. I was like, and I know it, but it always like is an inspiring film to me because I love the optimism of that ending is that idea of like, yeah, you know, you can be, you can do anything you want. And when the character in that, the critic at the end says, you know, I finally realize what Gusto, the chef meant by anybody can cook, not that anybody can cook, but a great cook can come from anywhere. 
And I just find that such a touching like message. And at the end then, you know, like you said, sorry, spoilers, but if you haven't seen Ratatouille, shame on you. Um, but when Remy, you know, like when he then has his restaurant and everything and you see uh, the wait- waiter go in and say, you know, well, it'll be tonight. And then it's Anton there like, you know, surprise me. And there's like that moment. I don't know why. It just gets me every time. And it goes to show that it doesn't, Pixar doesn't need to be death or like, big moments of like tragedy it can like hit you when it's just like happy moments as well and this like so that always like strikes me and i know craig would be happy like it's not so much again like once for our childhood like ratatouille and toy story were but inside out the fact that they had the balls to do that scene where you know they embrace sadness and how sadness can influence your happy memories so that scene it's what i think of it of when you're watching a film and you know when there's that scene or moment where you're like, wow, that's what this film is about. So like, uh, you know, call me by your name, when at the end, when he's saw like waiting for him to ring and everything, you're like, oh, I understand what this film's about now. It's like about losing that first love, etc. And it's the same with like most of the Pixar films. Is that moment in every film where you go, ah, oh, that's what this is about. And it's like that moment in Inside Out has been built into that the entire time. And they just get that perfect moment to be like, that's the film. It's about encapsulating these feelings and like the sadness is okay to feel and all that kind of stuff. And I think that that, that is so well done. Yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about Inside Out. I mean, if you were going to start me down that road. <laughs> yeah. Well, earlier I was sort of like watching back parts of it for reference and it was that scene where, you know, she comes home after running away and I was like, I can't stop watching this now. It's like getting too emotional. And then the only other one I think of is The Incredibles as well. And on a different level, I think that one, it's not so much the emotional part of it. It's just that that scene at the end where the family's like on the road uh, where they come off the the plane thing and uh, they crash land onto the road and they're trying to find the giant robot. And... Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Incredible are arguing about what turn off to take. And I always remember, again, watching that years later, revisiting it after childhood and being like, that's what this film is about. It's about like a family, like literally, like they're there arguing on the road. Like how perfect is that? And I love when you see those like behind the scenes of Pixar, they're there with the storyboards and they've storyboarded that out and they're all laughing at it because they're like, yeah, that's such a great idea. And they think through it as a collaborative process and... And it's those moments that I love is that you're like, that's what the film's about. And Incredibles, that's a perfect example of it, where you're like, that's what this film's about. It's about that chaotic family, which happened to be superheroes. Yeah, and it, as well, it's like it's like that idea of like different generations and different age groups sort of take different things from these films. And like over time, you take away different things because you kind of grow as a person. But those films is kind of still there for us to give us these things. Um uh, I, I was watching this video earlier about about 2001 a space odyssey and they were saying like when it first came out it wasn't doing so well and they were kind of like you know what's going on like why don't people understand it whatever and they i think years later they interviewed kids that had seen it and then they, they'd interviewed adults that had seen it and there's a scene where like one of the one of the scientists say like oh i'm going to and then they, they, they name this like really obscure planet where actually in the film they go to the moon but they interviewed the kids and the kids all understood that they were going to the moon Mm. Uh, and it's kind of like like how, how has that happened and i think it's that idea of like when you're a kid and you're watching something like that like what you take from it is different to what an adult is going to take from it um and i think that again is, is such an, an interesting kind of idea yeah it's interesting like said that the different approaches we've all taken like said isn't it? And, and that's where i think for me again like the pixar stuff it like influences me even creatively in the way you think of like oh well how can you expand your horizons how can you make these characters mean something to to its audience um, and look at things from a new spec- perspective and inspire people. So like the ending of Ratatouille, like it's a really inspirational story. So there's the reason for that. But there's also, like said, moments of comedy and sort of just setting your world as well. There's, those films are all really good. It's all like, this is the world that we're like in. So The Incredibles is kind of like, right, we're this like spy you know sit, you know embracing the 60s and that kind of like big michael giacchino score and inside out is like this kind of like melodic you know putting you inside the mind the soundtrack's like a big part of that and the look of the characters they're also like all bubbly and so sort of like imaginative um, and toy story is all about you know having that sort of like randy Newman music and i think that's why the first one also stands out to me is that even though each film has songs in it 
which is all play alongside the story. The first one is the one where the songs feel the most connected to the story as well. Like that moment when Buzz is realizes he can't fly, I think is like a really touching moment. Like, and the fact that you've got a song there saying, I will go sailing no more. Um, and it has lyrics like, no, it can't be true. And all that kind of stuff. It's, it's not like a musical in that the characters are singing these lyrics, but because they're made exclusively for that film, then they perfectly represent what's happening in that moment. So we'll go now to, of course, the movie vault. Uh, we haven't visited it or entered anything to it for a while, especially as, uh, again, one of our last visits there was involving uh, some very bad Fifty Shades films. So hopefully we can put some much better films in there uh, this week. So, yeah, talking about influential films, of course, like I said, I, I would say that, you know, especially the main three that we've talked about, I think would all be deserving of a place site. Like, I don't know what you guys think. Obviously, you know, Alid as a Kubrick fan, then, you know, all of them <laughs> go in and, and Pixar. I'd love all of them to go in. But, you know, if you were to pick that one, would it be The Shining, do you think? I think so. Yeah, just just from kind of like that brief conversation we had about how kind of even years and years later, we're still seeing these subtle hints to it, even in a place where it has no business being like like in, in, in a kid's, <laughs> you know, in, in in the first Toy Story, like it's so subtle, but it's there and it's been put there for a reason. Mm. You know, it's still influencing us now, and and to the fact that there was a you know, although this could be you know disputed, there was a need for a, a sequel in mm. four years later. We're still talking about this film, this idea that the story needs to kind of be continued. Like that's you know, that's a pretty decent shout there that it deserves a spot. Yeah, and and like I said, even the moments like we haven't mentioned about you know, Q's Johnny and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the, the swing in the bat, which me and Craig perfectly, <laughs> uh, reenacted once for another episode as well. So this, this film keeps popping up on the podcast. So it definitely should go. Was well, that acting that. out? I thought, I thought the <laughs> guests just overheard an argument of ours and we just sort of rolled with it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> What's your feelings with V Vendetta, Craig? Because yeah, what Alid said, they actually, about this film that keeps popping up, it's similar for that, isn't it? It's that, you know, the mask has become infamous, you know, with, Anonymous. Anonymous, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people, like I said, have been like, oh my God, we're living in this film at the moment and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it's... I I would personally like to see it go in. At the end of the day, I think... I think it is a... I think it is a strong blend of just... Uh, just taking, like, a, a sort of superhero mass vigilante aspect, but just ingraining it with a lot of actual worthwhile political discussion. Um as well as just sort of like a beginner's intro to anarchy, uh, yeah. which is, you know, always fun. But yeah, I think I think there is a degree to which it does pop up a lot more for uh, for people, just into insofar as coming across the film anyway and like what it's trying to trying to talk about. Uh it takes one of the most popular ideas within superhero and I think gives it the strongest sort of worth, the idea that I am more than just a man behind a mask. Um and I think that's something that like a lot of people sort of especially in you no know, we're definitely in the days of like, you know, you have social movements growing more and more. The idea that they care more about symbolic values uh, as opposed to just like individual people sort of leading those revolutions. So the yeah. idea of somebody being more than just more than just a person and those ideas being essentially bulletproof is quite prominent today. So I think probably a good reason to put it in. Yeah. And a good example of how, like you said, a film a superhero film essentially or like a comic book film can be talking uh, can be making these political references and comparisons because again back then you know especially if you were going to like 10 years before that film you got the likes of you know batman and robin and things like you know even like tim burton's batman they're not there so making as much political commentary and even now with a lot of the marvel and dc stuff they don't go there as much where something like this is doing that I mean, you just just you have to look at the domino sequence alone to get the idea of just of just what this film is trying to do. The idea of just like collective action against against oppressors is just something that is just more and more relevant. Yeah. And that was a change they made in the adaptation as well, wasn't it? You were saying about the differences uh, which Alan Moore didn't like, but they they did sort of make it again less about sort of comparisons to 80s. Uh, conservative Britain to more like the American kind of post 9-11 style of you know media coverage and that kind of stuff 
very indicative of that time when it came out as well so yeah i would agree with that and i think yeah surprising i d- yeah toy story has not gone in there so again as much as i'd love every toy story film to go in i think the fact that also like alid said you know it's it, his favorite of the of the saga apart from maybe toy story 4 as it made him cry so much in the cinema but we, we were with you alid we, we had an emotional time as well despite the fact that craig had to sit next to a crying child when we saw it uh, i think that stunted his emotions a bit <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, so yeah, do we all agree going into the movie vault this week then would be V for Vendetta, The Shining and Toy Story? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, into the movie vault then it goes Toy Story, V for Vendetta and The Shining. We're in the end game now. Oh. It's so annoying. Okay, end game time. So... To continue the theme of inspiration, I decided that we're going to take a trip to Inspiration Corner. So the idea of this is that obviously films try to be inspirational as much as possible to the point that many films have ve- uh, very many inspirational quotes that people often then use. However, I have found that in researching this, they sort of blur in together uh, and it can be a little bit unclear. So that's going to be part of the game. So I have two sets of inspirational quotes, and I'm going to ask each of you one at a time which film you think the quote is from. I've given you an option of two films, so you basically have a 50-50 chance to get it right. If there's a tie break, I have a tie, I have a tie breaker situation ready. So, Alid, as you're the guest, would you like set A or set B? A. We'll go for A. Fantastic. So what I'll do is I'll read out the quote. I'll give you the option of films, and then you can decide which one you think it is. Boy, okay, here we go. Number one. Nobody is going to hit as hard as life, but it ain't how hard you can hit. It's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. It's how much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Oh, boy. So off before I give you the options, any ideas what that could be? No. <laughs> okay. No. So your options yeah. are Fight Club or Rocky Balboa? I'm going to say Rocky Balboa. We're looking for Rocky Balboa. <laughs> it is. I was going to say it sounds like a sports kind of speech. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one point to Alid. David, are you ready for your quote? Yes. Sometimes the right path is not the easiest one. Mm, quite vague. <laughs> <laughs> so the options you have, is that Pocahontas or Pinocchio? That sounds like something Jiminy Cricket would say, so I'm going to go Pinocchio. I'm looking for Pinocchio. Ah, uh, this big. It was a grandma the willow or something, is it? Yeah, probably. Mm. <laughs> Damn that tree. <laughs> Actually, it might be your dad. Your dad's quite like inspirational as well. Just unfortunately for you, da- uh, David, one of the quotes on this on this article I found was "Do or do not." There is no try. But I thought, <laughs> there's no way I'm giving that. <laughs> okay, Alid. Quote number two. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. Okay. Your your options are Ferris Bueller's Day Off yeah. or Cars. <laughs> um, Ferris Bueller. You're going for Fel- uh, Ferris Bueller? Yeah. Is it bad that I saw Cars before that option even came up? So I would have gone for Cars. And if I was right, I would have been like, this is so sad. But I'm, I'm glad, glad it was wrong now. <laughs> <laughs> you hear it and you're like, I'm pretty sure what that is, but then it doesn't matter what the answer is, you're like, but is it is it that other one though? Yeah. Especially with that because it's like you know fast lane and you're like, mm. Yeah. Ooh. Again, the annoying thing, uh the annoying thing for David is there's also a ratatouille uh quote on this list that I decided not to use either. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> if you focus on what you left behind, you will never be able to see what lies ahead. So David, your actual quote. To see the world, things dangerous to come to. To see behind walls, to draw closer, to find each other and to feel. That is the purpose of life. Oh, it sounds like something like Spock or something. 
Well, your options are The Secret Life of Walter Mitty or Downsizing. Oh, okay. Right, so definitely not in <laughs> space then. Um, so I've not seen Walter Mitty, so I'm going to take a chance to say Downsizing because it could be the sort of side character in that the Matt Damon comes across based on the, the type of speech and dialect. Just check, just checking which uh, which side character? The lady that he meets who's been like, yeah, I can't, I can't remember. Her <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, it was Secret Life of War. Just to check, you said from the dialect, just because I was reading it out, it's complicated sentences and you just thought, yeah, it must be a non- No, it's non just, native. no, it's that second, that second line. It was just like, say the second one again. Things dangerous to come. Yeah, it's just the fact they didn't say like, oh, the things. It sounded like somebody who was like more broken English to me. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, that, we've learned a lot about you today then, <laughs> Go watch the film, you'll know what I mean. That's just how they speak. So, Alid, your third quote. You'll have bad times, but it'll always wake you up to the good stuff you weren't paying attention to. So your options are Dead Poet Society or Goodwill Hunting. Oh, yeah. What a choice. <laughs> um, okay. Edging more towards Goodwill Hunting. You go in Goodwill Hunting? Yeah. That's another point. <laughs> David. Oh, God. <laughs> the very things that hold you down are going to lift you up. Any mm. initial thoughts what that could be? No. Okay, so your options are Top Gun or Dumbo. <laughs> in, uh, in, in the spirit and tribute of uh, Daft Punk, I'm going to ask one more time. The very things that hold you down are going to lift you up. I'm going to say Top Gun. Oh, God's sake. <laughs> I was like, that sounds too philosophical for Dumbo, but it was okay. Uh, it, it is Dumbo. Uh. <laughs> so Again, I'm just going to hate on some animated characters. Is it the mouse? Is it the mouse? <laughs> right, just so, just to check. After three questions, <laughs> Alit is on three, David is on zero. Yeah. It's now impossible for David to win. Oh, God. But so we will continue the game. It's just about me getting some shred of dignity. <laughs> okay, Alit, are you ready for number seven? I am ready. Just because something works doesn't mean it can't be improved. Your options are Black Panther or the perks of being a wallflower. Perks of being a wallflower. Nope, it's Black Panther. Yeah, I think that one I could imagine T'Challa saying that, actually, if it is him. It wasn't T'Challa, it was his sister, whose name I can't remember. David, are you ready for quote number four? Why not? <laughs> Hope is not a strategy. Well, it should be in this endgame. <laughs> uh, uh, no idea. Okay, uh, are you ready for the options? Yeah. Your options are Selma or Mission Impossible Fallout. Oh, God, what the hell? <laughs> okay. Just trying to think who is more likely to say this. Is it going to be Martin Luther King or Tom Cruise? <laughs> um, uh, go for Selma. Oh! <laughs> oh, I was hoping you'd see it's such a ludicrous distinction. Uh... <laughs> It's in Mission Impossible 4. Like God's that. sake. <laughs> it's the fact that they're going to go cross that bridge. I just assumed that they would be like, this is not a strategy we want to take in crossing the bridge. or whatever. Okay, Alid, your final quote. Everything yeah. is possible, even the impossible. So is that Mary Poppins Returns or Nanny McPhee? <laughs> Mary Poppins. I'm looking for Mary Poppins. Oh, it's just making the win even harsher. <laughs> <laughs> and now, David, for the game <laughs> point, as in your only point to this game. God. <laughs> your quote. A laugh can be a very powerful thing. Why, sometimes in life, it's the only weapon we have. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. Okay. So your options, is it Who Framed Roger Rabbit or is it Patch Adams? Oh, 
killing me with these Robin Williams films. I think it's Jessica Rabbit in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yeah, I think so too. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> They'd just be giving away the entire film of Patch Adams with that if they were just like, why is he doing this? Well. <laughs> so, the final scores at the end of that game. <clears throat> David has one. Alid is the winner with four. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations also. Thankfully, I didn't like completely show myself as a complete travesty, but well done, Alid. Do you, do you feel that... Uh, Very close. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, the vast majority of those were complete guesses. <laughs> there was only one that I was pretty confident about, so... Yeah, surprising with inspirational stuff, isn't it? Because you get your kind of like, you know, I am your father, those kind of memorable lines. But when it comes to more inspirational, it kind of... Like you said, a lot of them were somewhat vague. Yeah, you lose you lose the defining aspects of each one. So you know, it's you're like, trying to look for like <clears throat> wording or 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 like the way something's said to kind of figure out where it's from. So yeah. it's a hard one. So kudos, mm. Miss Craig. Yeah. So yeah, uh, well done, Alid, and uh, yeah, thank you for joining us today, guys. And uh, let us know at home, you know, how did you do? Did you do as bad as I did? <laughs> and, uh, you know, what inspirational lines do you think of? Uh, so, Ali, thank you for joining us today, talking all about influential films and some of our, like, personal favorites, those films that we feel were made for us and speak to us directly. Uh, where can the people catch you? And uh, what are you up to at the moment, project-wise? Yes, thank, thank, thanks so much for having me. So, yeah, I'm on, I'm on Instagram and Twitter, the most in terms of social media and stuff, which is... The handle is at Aled's Picture. Like I said before, just trying to get my head down and, and get as much work done. The exciting thing is I'm selling some prints at the moment. Um, so if you want to kind of jazz up your flat, seeing as we we're spending 99.9% of our times in our homes, and you want to kind of get that aesthetic levels up, then please um, go to my Etsy shop, which is etsy.com slash shop slash Aled's Picture. Um, I think I might do a giveaway soon as well. So look out on the old... Uh, social medias that um but yeah thanks so much for having me it's always it's always great yeah well we hope to have you back on soon i would say we'd maybe have you with the james bond episode but it might be 2029 before uh no time to die comes out <laughs> in cinemas i'm pretty sure i'm gonna <laughs> be is... dead by the time that no time to die comes out <laughs> alid is definitely dying inside every time those delays happen i, I feel i feel bad for him. <laughs> <laughs> craig anything lastly from yourself to gild refined gold, to paint the lily, to lock up your friends, it's just fucking silly. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> what which film is that from? Is it from? <laughs> it's a it's a it's a quote from a Tim Minchin song. Or a, a, a Tim Minchin beat poem, I should say. Surprised you didn't put that in the end game just to throw us. <laughs> oh, I contemplated putting in a hustle quote just to really mess with you. But... Uh, so, yeah, guys, uh, thank you for listening to us. You can catch us on all our socials as well. You can catch us at Well Good Movies on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And you can also catch us on our website, which is freshtakehub.com slash wellgoodmovies, where you can catch all of our episodes. Uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, please do uh, subscribe follow us share this podcast where you can tell your friends all about it if you are on apple then reviews massively help us a lot as well so yeah please do give us a like a rate a share all of it really helps and uh yeah we hope to be talking movies again with you uh very soon craig we've got another special coming up as well which is worth uh, telling the people about yes it's going to be my birthday soon so i'm basically having a party and by that i mean i'm conscripting a load of people to play some end games <laughs> <laughs> stay tuned to that guys it'll be uh more teams uh getting involved uh seeing who comes out victorious and based off our last two especially at christmas it's sure to be a fun and chaotic time so yeah We'll catch you on the next one, guys. And uh, thanks once again to Alid for joining us. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.
Jesus Christ, that was quick. All right, see you guys next episode. <laughs>